And in Hebrews chapter 5, remember this is a book that's being written by someone. We don't know exactly whom. Some people simply say it's Paul. Some say it was one of his assistants. Uh, but it doesn't give us a, a name of, of who wrote this. But it was written towards Jewish people, people who were once uh, uh, Jewish by blood. And so by tradition, they were simply um, Jews. And so they, they worshiped God by tradition. If you are Mexican, if you are Latino in any way, you will understand that just by tradition, people are Catholic. And so you might not even go to Catholic. You might not uh, church. You might not ever been step into a cathedral, but you would simply say, well, I was, I guess I'm simply a Catholic because I guess my family, my grandma says she was Catholic. So that makes me Catholic. These people, the Jewish people, a lot of them would simply say, well, I'm Jewish and I celebrate Hanukkah and I, and I, and I have a few other other little traditions in my family. Uh, we light a menorah. We do those kind of things, but it's not a big deal. It doesn't really, uh, uh, you know, really uh, reflect of how I live my life. And so it doesn't mean that Jesus came and started a whole new religion. He was the fulfillment of the Jewish religion or the Jewish faith. Everything that we see in the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi, it is all a preparation and a, and a reminder to all humanity, not just the Jewish people, all of humanity, you you are a sinner. You can't follow not only the Ten Commandments, but all of the 100, 200, up to 600 commandments that they added more onto, that you cannot follow all of these rules. Because of that, you need a Savior. So Malachi kind of finishes negatively or sad, hopeless, because uh, I guess I'm, we're just sinners and we can never fix ourselves. It, it, it's just impossible. Then Matthew begins and Jesus is born. And so he is the Savior, the fulfillment of the whole Old Testament. And so by the time of Jesus, there were many Jewish people by tradition that end up believing in Jesus as the Messiah, the promised Messiah, the Christ, the, the chosen one that would deliver and save the people of Israel. But Jesus shows up and he says, I'm not just here for the people of Israel. I'm here as it was always promised that all the nations of the world will get to know that God is the Savior, that God loves them, that God has a purpose for them. And so the whole world then began to know who Jesus is. And so including these Jewish or Hebrew people, or Israelites, they, they started to, to believe now in Jesus, but it was difficult for them because they were, they were so tempted to go back to their old traditional ways. They, it was just easy to just play church or play temple or just go to the, go to the, and, and go through the motions of religion instead of being focused on still trusting in Jesus because at the time back then it's not like us here in America in which we believe in Jesus whenever we feel like it and whenever we want our needs met or we need a, a, a miracle and so we go to Jesus. In other parts of the world, they believe in Jesus and if you believe in them, you have the danger of going to prison or maybe even death. Back then, that's what these Jewish people were saying. Man, this is getting a little bit dangerous. It's, uh, uh, it's getting too hot out here in the streets. It's, it's, uh, uh, I, I, should, I should just go back to just being a nice... Nice, uh, uh, nice, loving little Jew that just goes to temple and goes through the traditions instead of being one of these hated Christians. And so the author of Hebrews is writing to encourage them, no, 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 don't stop, don't stop meeting, don't stop believing, keep pushing forward, keep believing in Jesus, He is your Savior, don't go back. And so Hebrews chapter 5 verse 1, it says, He, spe he begins to speak about priests. And it talks about how every high priest is selected from among the people. He's just a human. And he's selected from them and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God. He's that representative, okay, between God and the people. To offer gifts and sacrifice for sins. That was the priest's responsibilities. He would, he would say, these are the sinners. We're actually all sinners. But God, you chose me to represent them. So... They need a Savior. They can't do it themselves. We need, a, we need a, a forgiveness of our sins because someone needs to die. Someone needs to be punished because you are also a good judge. And a good judge doesn't just kind of turn his eyes on sin. No, someone needs to be punished. And what was it that was punished? Usually it was a lamb, a sheep, a, a, a bird, a, an oxen, a, an animal. A, a pure animal, nothing wrong, nothing didn't hurt anybody, didn't, didn't bite someone, so it deserves to be killed. No, it was just a, uh, we would even say a sinless animal. But that sinless animal dies in the place of 
the humans. And so the priest was responsible of killing that animal in such a way that it honored God and it paid for our sins. So verse 2, he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. So he is ha a priest, a good priest, is there representing God. And since God is also very gentle, God is also very, very gracious. God, as it's been said before, he is a gentleman, that he doesn't force anything upon us, that he doesn't push himself on us, that he simply says, you want this? I love you, my son. I love you, my daughter. And so he wants to bless us. And if we reject them, he simply says, okay. But because a priest is representing all of that to the people, uh, I think a lot of us, a lot of us uh, humans, a lot of us churchgoers, we have an understanding of who God is depending on the pastor. And uh, that's just simply how us as humans think. That's just simply psychology. And, and uh, so that's why the responsibility of a pastor, it's huge. Because uh, a lot of us, or sometimes just your dad, your, your own father, we think of God depending on how our Christian father or the pastor is. And so I go to some churches sometimes and, and I hear how the pastor preaches. And this guy's an angry man. And so the people there in the church think that God is an angry God. Then you go to churches where the pastor is just love all the time and just God is just perfect all the time. You're a champion. Everything's great. We don't talk about sin here. We just love everyone. Everything's great. You know, no, no big deal. You're in sin. Eh, it's fine. God loves you too. It's all fine. It's okay. <laughs> and, and so there's all that. And, and, and so what does the people do? That's how they live. So the church is full, 60,000 people living in sin, but they're, they're still, they're, still uh, they're happy. They're happy people. They're champions. And so, so we, have, we have both sides. And we need a little bit of both. We need, we need a good, good little wrath pastor that talks about sin. We, talk, we need a good pastor that, that shouts that too. But, and then we need a good pastor that talks about being a champion and, 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 and being, living on purpose and, and, and all of that. But we have to be very careful of not simply looking at, at God, depending on what the, what the pastor is or who your dad was, but depending on what the scripture, how he, how the, the Lord himself describes himself. But a priest is that representative. And so it's a big responsibility. And so I love that it says that the priest himself is weak. The, the man, he's still a human. He's not, a, he's not anything um, supernatural. He's still a human that was simply chosen by God to represent him. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. Those of you that come from a, let me get some water, those of you that get, come from a, maybe a, a, a Catholic church, or come from a background with priests, uh, this, this makes a little bit more sense. And because, um, sorry, I, I'm, I'm on like so much allergy and, and uh, <clears throat> pills that are drying up my mouth. But um, those, you, you, you remember, right? You would go and, and have confession with a priest and all that. And, and sometimes you may even think that's God. And, and um, I love Catholics. I love because they, they honor the pastor. They honor the, the, the man with the man of the cloth. They honor them so much. Uh, I, I walk around, and, and so I, uh, I'll meet people, and, and uh, they say, what do you do? Or I work with people. They say, what do you do? I'm, well, I'm also a pastor. And, oh, pastor, oh, father. Right away, they start calling me father. They start, it's very, it's very honoring. I had a, a, a friend that he would walk around the neighborhood inviting people to church, and, and no one, everyone ignored him until he started, he put on a collar, you know, like the priests do. He put on one of those collared shirts, and he says, it's not a big deal. It's just, uh, it just represents being a minister. And so he put it on. All of a sudden, everybody would come up to him and ask for prayer, and they would come up to him, give me your blessing, father. Give me your blessing. And so, so there is this idea that we recognize that, that this is a representative of God, but at the same time, we could forget that that is also a human, and it comes and it happens in our Christian churches too, evangelical churches, that we sometimes forget that that person on the stage, he's also a sinner, that she also needs a savior, that he needs a savior, and so this is a reminder that he needed to sacrifice for his own sins as well for the sins of the people. Verse four, and no one takes this honor on himself. But he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. So no one makes himself a priest. No one makes himself a pastor. No one makes himself any, any kind of title. But it's, it's God who does it. 
as Aaron was. Aaron was that brother of Moses. Moses was the one that was called to be a prophet, to lead the people. But then there was this, this uh, uh, need that God wanted to train the people. Remember, there were always slaves before. And, and uh, please be patient with me this morning because uh, I want to give you a lot of background. And, and so those of you that know all of these things, good for you. Uh, uh, but, but you also have to be patient because there, there might be someone in the room that doesn't know uh, some of these things. And so when, even when I bring up Moses to a lot of you say, yeah, amen, a lot of you also would say, who's Moses? And that's not a problem. That's good. That we, we love that. And, and we need to learn. With, and then there's those that have been in church for 50 years and fake it. And they say, oh, yeah, 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 Moses, Moses. I don't know who Moses is, but they fake it. And so don't be one of those. Just learn with us and let's, let's be patient. Moses led the people out of slavery. These former slaves were taught for 400 years how to do things. So now they have freedom. God gives them a set of rules. How to live, how to survive, how to, how to eat, how to dress, where to sleep, who to sleep with, and who not to sleep with. All of these things, God was giving them all these little details. And, and who was going to give them all of this? Not, just, not, not only Moses that brought the Ten Commandments. Moses was in charge of making sure that everyone was doing what they were supposed to do. And so he then delegated some of the res responsibilities. And one of those responsibilities was that of a priest, and that was given to Aaron. Aaron and his family then became the Levites. The Levites uh, became the priests, the ones that took care of all the things in the tabernacle, which later became a beautiful temple. They took care of all the sacrifices, of all the things that needed to be done. And so it was like this, this uh, family business, this, this uh, lineage uh, that if you were born in that family, you automatically became a Levite. Now, it wasn't a bad thing because they were taken care of. All the other uh, um, uh, families and all the other uh, uh, tribes, they, they had to work for their own. They had, to they had to take care of themselves and figure things out. But all the families would give a tithe of what they received, so 10% of everything that they had, including food. And so they would give that to the temple so that the Levites, the priests, could be fed, could be taken care of. And so, yeah, they had a lot of responsibilities in the temple, but they were taken care of by all the rest of the people. And so this is what was happening, and, and so in the same way that Aaron was chosen, the rest of these priests were chosen as well. Verse 5, in the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest. It wasn't that Jesus himself showed up and said, now I am a high priest. Now I, am, I have the same, uh, because I am the Son of God, I have that, that authority. Of course he did, but it wasn't, he didn't force it on himself. But God said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. At that moment that Jesus is being baptized in Mark chapter 1, the, the, the baptism isn't Jesus saying, I am a sinner. I'm dying of my sin and I'm coming back to life out of the, the baptismal waters as a new life. Uh, why? Because Jesus wasn't a sinner. He hadn't sinned yet. Even though he grew up as a teenager and was a man, he was strong enough to not fall to the sins. And so he hadn't sinned. He's about age 30 right here. And John the Baptist, who, by the way, his family came from that lineage of priests, and, and his own dad was a priest, and, and now John the Baptist is preaching about the Messiah one day coming, the Savior of the world, Jesus. And so now Jesus comes and he says, you need to baptize me. And John the Baptist says, no, you should baptize me. You're the Son of God. You're the Lamb of the world. You are the one that's going to die in my place. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. You need to baptize me. And you know why, John. Why? Because he is, the, he is a priest. He is a, he's a representative of a high priest. A high priest was not just one of the workers the high priest was the one that would give the, the, the official sacrifice for everyone else, including all the other priests and workers of the temple. And so John the Baptist was, came from that lineage of, of high priests, uh, including his father Zechariah. And so when, John, when Jesus is being baptized, at that moment, it says that the heavens open up, that God from heaven, the Father, he sees down to his Son, the, the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and he says, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. At that moment, Jesus then receives that anointing or that calling or that blessing that, comes, that, that John the Baptist had, and it falls upon Jesus. And now Jesus is now, spiritually speaking, symbolically a high priest. At that moment, he's not only the Son of God, he's not only from a 
royal family because his own dad, earthly dad, uh, uh, Joseph, yes, did Joseph have anything to do with the birth? No, but uh, uh, the lineages wouldn't come from Mary, the mom. It would come from, uh, from the father. And so it wasn't a coincidence that Mary was engaged to this man named Joseph. Why? Because then it just connected everything. Joseph was like the great, 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 great grandson of King David. That technically, if there wasn't a Roman Empire, uh, Joseph wouldn't have been a, a, a carpenter. Joseph would have been a king of Israel. It's just so crazy. And so Joseph would have, would have had a son, and his son would have also been king. Why? Because Jesus came from a royal family, and that made him officially the king of Israel. And so, but there was a royal empire. There was, there was uh, um, other, other nations that came and, and took down the, the nation of Israel. All that royalty was gone. There wasn't any, any, anything more. But if you simply follow the bloodline, it went all the way back to that. And so, here is Jesus. Here is, here is Jesus being baptized, receiving the blessing now of a priest. He is royalty by blood and is now priest by calling. He is priest by that anointing, by that blessing. And so it says, verse 6, and he says in another place, God does, you are a priest forever. That, that Jesus is a priest forever, is a representative of God here on earth. In the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. If you have a, a highlighter, a pen, a circle, that name, we've we got to go back to that right now. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, God. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Jesus, he showed us what it means to be a priest, a representative of God. He, he would cry out to God the Father. When he would pray, he would say, God, these people, my disciples, these people, they need you to save them, my God. They need you to save them. And then Jesus steps in the middle, in that gap between the sinners and God, and there is Jesus. And so, uh, uh, and it says that God the Father heard him because he was submitted to God. He lived in that way, submitted, uh, recognizing that God the Father was the only one that could save them. So, he, would, he lived in such a way that obeyed God so that God could listen to his prayers so that they would be blessed. Verse 8, son, though he was, he was actually the son of God, he learned obedience from what he, from what he suffered. Oh, man, that's one of the, well, how come we don't like that verse? How come we don't make uh, t-shirts and posters and Hobby Lobby, when you go in, you don't find uh, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8. That needs to become one of our life verses, not just, not just John 3.16 or Philippians 4.13. I could do all things through Christ. Amen. Yeah, well, you know what? Verse 8, son, though he was, he's the son of God, but he learned obedience from what he suffered. <laughs> In our suffering, we talked about that on Wednesday night. We talked about good suffering, how to suffer well. That sometimes in our suffering, we could fall apart, curse God, run away from our problems. Or we could simply say, God, you're still God. I'm going to trust you in this. And yes, I'm hurting, but I'm going to trust that you have something greater from all of this. And if you're going to create in me perseverance, create in me a better character, create in me wisdom from all of these problems, then I am all for it, God. So, just like Jesus, he was able to learn obedience from suffering. Even Jesus said, I don't, I, I don't want to go to the cross, Father, but not my will be done. Let your will be done. And even on to the cross, he says, it is finished. He was obedient all the way to death. And verse 9, once made perfect, now Jesus becomes perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. There it is again. There's that name again. So before we do all that, there's a need for a priesthood. God instituted the priesthood because no matter how hard people try, they still sin against God. They can't help it. We are naturally sinners from a child that right away begins to hit their brother or sister, from a kid that right away says, no, mine. We are naturally sinners in, in, inside of us. As soon as we're able to have thoughts or words, the selfishness comes out. All sin and fall short of God's expectations. Thank you. <laughs> and so we are 
we are all in need of that, of that, of that Savior because we fall short of, of what God wants from us. And so because of our sin, people need someone to go to God on behalf of us. And people tend to be scared of a holy God. If you really recognize how good God is, that's why a lot of people say, I don't want to go to church. They're scared of a holy God. There's something inside of us naturally that also recognizes how much we are sinners and how holy and perfect God is and how we should not be anywhere near Him. But they think incorrectly that His anger will just somehow uh, get so much that because of their failures that He will kill them. And so technically, like I said, a lot of people get very theological, very biblical. They're correct. Because of our sin, the, the holiness of God should kill us. It, it, it's just we can't stand in front of the holy God. Those high priests, when they would go into, into this, this holy place to go and give a sacrifice to God, if they didn't go outside of the temple through the whole uh, um, uh, uh, ritual of, of washing themselves, of asking, and as they washed themselves, it wasn't just washing their hands, okay? Don't, don't think it's, it was that easy, just washing their hands, and they would let the water just drip down so that the water could drip into, onto the floor off their elbows, and then they would wash their face, and, and it wasn't just the hand washing. While they did that, that was symbolic physically of what was happening inside of them and so they're going far they're going they wouldn't say father because jesus taught us to say father they would just simply say yahweh god holy god you are holy i am a sinner you are holy i am a sinner please forgive me please purify me wash me i'm about to enter into your holy place please purify me i don't want to die they would put bells around them just in case as soon as the people outside stop hearing the bells ringing they would just hear a boom on the floor. The bell stops ringing. That means the guy didn't actually repent of his sin. He's still a sinner. He died in the presence of God. They would put a rope around them, and they would pull him out. And you can put that picture of a, of a priest. I think I have him there. And, and so that's how, that's how they would dress. So all of these things, the colors, the stones on this, all of it represented something. And so, so they would wrap the, the, they would, the rope around the waist, and they would pull him out because he was dead. And so, yes, 100%, if we go into the presence of God as sinners, we will die. But the advantage of a high priest was that he was human and that he was a sinner. People were not afraid to go to him because he understood their sins and their failures. And, and he was just one of them. So God needed to, to make this, this whole uh, idea of a priest. And, and so the, there was a, a human high priest even though he was still the one that represented God, that still, he would still fall. He would still be a sinner. By the time of Jesus, there was a high priest named Caiaphas, and he was just following the money. The Roman Empire, they were paying him off, and they were making sure that he did whatever, whatever they told him to. And so that's why John the Baptist, a high priest, he was simply thrown over there, out there into the desert. And he was having to do all of the priestly duties the pure ones, the real ones, out in the desert, hiding from the Roman Empire. While Caiaphas, the little puppet priest of the Romans, was doing all of that there in the city. And so, so again, even the priests would fall into sin. But it says over and over that Jesus was called to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. What? Now, you know, I, I don't want to be a church that we all just say, hmm, <laughs> or a, yeah, amen. And then, and then we, we, uh, we walk out, uh, you know, have no idea. I don't know what that, what that was all about. And, and uh, we act it and we fake it. And then we, we uh, go 20 years later and we have no idea uh, who this Melchizedek is. So let's, let's, let's understand who this Melchizedek is. Who is this man? Who was Melchizedek and what was his significance? So, okay, I don't even know if we'll get to the points today, so just be patient with me, okay? So, it says, because we got to have this, this foundation, we have to have this understanding. It says in the, in that all the way to the book of Genesis, in the beginning, that it always goes back to them. Adam and Eve, that's the whole reason all this had to happen, because Adam and Eve, they wanted that fruit and instead of being obedient to God. But Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. They were to represent God here on earth. 
they were to to the animals. And but it, but I really believe it says that there was there were they would have to uh, uh, they were going to have children and all of this. And uh, uh, children are not a, a curse; <laughs> they're not part of the curse of sin. That they were going to have children, they were going to have family, and they were all going to live together there in the garden. Everything was going to be perfect and pure and and just honoring God. But it was that God said, "You will reign. You will rule." over this earth and so he blessed them and so think of think of this stage here as as the garden of eden he they, there is adam and eve and they received the blessing from god the father and he says you will reign you will rule you have the blessing of of being my representatives here on this earth and you are created in my image everything that i am i am holy i am pure i am good i am righteous i am i am a just god all of that is now in you perfect and so they're there they received the blessing then who knows how much time went on and they spent some time in the garden. It says that Adam would walk with God and they had a great relationship. But then finally the serpent is there in the garden. Why is he there? Who knows? But he's there in the garden. And in the garden there is this snake that goes up to, to uh, 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 Eve. And I said, I said he goes up to Eve because it says that the, sla- that the snake is part of the curse. Then he had to crawl on the earth after that for all eternity. So maybe he was walking, <laughs> and, and maybe he's, or simply he's on that tree, and he goes up to, to uh, Eve, and he says, surely you won't die if you take from this, from this fruit. Surely, are you really going to die? Is it really going to be so bad? That same question people are still asking today. Today, people are still saying, uh, this says it's a sin here. But it's all the way in Genesis. And that was thousands of years ago. Surely if I do it now, it's not going to be so bad. It says that there's a sin here. It says it in Revelation. But still, that was 2,000 years ago. And, and uh, it's gone through so many translations. It's a, well, we live in modern times. We have technology. We have science. And surely, will, will it be so bad? Will God really punish me? I don't think so. And so we are making that same decision that Eve made there thousands and thousands of years ago. She simply said, you know what, that's true. God said so, but I'm going to go ahead and do it my way. So she takes the fruit. Here comes Adam. Adam comes in. Adam sees his beautiful wife. She's also naked. So then he goes, yeah, I'll do whatever I want, girl. And so he says, she says, here's, my, here's the fruit. And now Adam takes the fruit. And that's not just an apple, it was a fruit. Maybe it was a mango. I think it was mango because mango is more tempting than, a, than an apple. And, and so, so the, I'm trying to wake you up. And so here comes, here comes Adam. He takes the fruit as well. They both, at that moment, it's over. They both disobey God. At that moment, that blessing that they, were, that they had with God, perfect blessing, connection with God, is cut off now they're out of the garden. There was the garden. There was the blessing. Now they're out of the garden. By God's grace, God's forgiveness, God's mercy, he had a plan. And that plan was that he still would meet the needs of his people from Adam and Eve. Then later on comes, comes the Noah. And still, there was sin around the world. Uh, uh, God punishes the sin of the world, but he saves the one righteous man, Moses, and his family. And, and uh, they still are protected by God from that lineage. Uh, I, I believe it was the, the great-great-grandson of Noah. There was a man named Abraham. Abraham is now this, once again, this man that God says, I want you to follow me and obey in me and, and trust in me. And Abraham says, I will trust you, me and my wife. We're going to go and we're going to trust you. And God says, I will bless you because of you trusted me. I will bless you. I will bless you. I will, I will bless you and your family. And I will give you so many descendants. You don't even have a son yet. But I'm going to give you and your wife a son. And he's going to have so many descendants and even all the stars in the sky, all the, the, the little pebbles in the, in the sand of the beaches, it won't even be enough to count how many descendants you will have. Abraham in his old age, he says, I'll trust you. I believe in you. I will hope in you. And he does it. And he, so he receives. He receives the blessing from God. And so now you could say that here is Adam. I mean, here is Abraham. Descendant of Adam. 
even though now they're still not fully in the garden, in that pure perfection, he still receives this blessing from God, this, this promise from God, and now his sons, his daughters, his son Isaac, his grandson Jacob, who later becomes Israel, Israel's 12 sons, his tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel, all of them receive from the blessing of Abraham. Now, during the time in which Abraham is making the decision to obey God and trust in him, he is, he is traveling with his, with his tribe, with his people, with his uh, servants and everything else. It says that Abraham was a rich man. He came all the way from the land of what we would call today Iraq. It was the land of Ur. And, and so he had wealth. His dad was a wealthy man. And so they, they, he had all of this. But he meets this, this man in a, in a place called Shalem. And that man, his name is Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, he comes out and he is not just the king of Shalem, but he is also a priest. And what's awesome is that at the time, there wasn't that many people who had a relationship with our one true God. Abraham, Abraham heard the voice of God and, and as, as God said, follow me, Abraham, go to the land that I have promised you. And he trusted in him. And Abraham would look around and all the other people were worshiping the sun and worshiping rocks and worshiping themselves. And, and, uh, and so when Abraham meets Melchizedek, he wasn't just a, a mighty king, rich, wealthy king. He was also representing God, that same Yahweh God, that same one true God. And so Abraham has this moment in which he's thinking, you also believe in him? Yes, yes, I do. And, and uh, what's so beautiful is that Abraham testifies to, to Melchizedek and he says, I've gone and I've done all of this and, and uh, I trusted in the Lord and I'm believing in this. And from that testimony, Melchizedek then has this moment in which he says, wow, Abraham, good for you. You are a good, obedient man of God. You and, you and your wife, I bless you. As a representative of my God, I bless you. So he was a king, but back then, there was no, a king was a king. He ruled the people. And then there was the priest. The priest represented God to the people. And so no one was ever a priest and a king at the same time, except for this man Melchizedek. It, I mean, even King David later on, he, he had a great relationship with God. But even himself, just, just in, in, in obedience to how God planned all this out, he was the king and he had a priest. And he had someone else to do all of those things. And, and so, but this Melchizedek, there was something unique about him that he says, that he says, I will bless you and Abraham, you, you Abraham and Sarah, and, and your whole descendants, and you will be blessed. Abraham then receives the blessing. He, see, he receives a blessing. Just think of the blessing that, that Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden. Abraham is receiving something very similar to it. And then Abraham, he is just so honored and so thankful that he then returns back 10% of everything he owned. It was a symbolic way of him saying, thank you of everything I have, I give you 10% of it right back to you to honor you, Melchizedek. He was, Abraham recognized him not just as a king. You don't do that to kings, you did it to priests. And so he recognized him as a, as a representative of God. It was as if Abraham was giving 10% of everything he owed to God himself. Later on, that whole uh, 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 rule or, or tradition started with, with the priests that, again, like I said earlier, that the other tribes and the other families, they would take care of the priests by giving them 10%. But it all goes back to Abraham and Melchizedek. And so Abraham does this. What's so awesome about the city, the kingdom that Melchizedek had, I said it was called Shalem. Later on, that Shalem becomes Jerusalem Shalem. Jerusalem, that that same place where Melchizedek was the king of, that later on that becomes Jerusalem, the place where the temple of God was, born, was, was, was built, that in that temple was the very presence of God in that same place where once there was a Melchizedek that owned and, and, and that reigned over that land. But also, it says that later on, Abraham has a son named Isaac, and that God gave him that promise of a son. But that God said, I want you to give that son right back to me. I want you to trust me, but I also want you to obey me. 
I gave you a son. You waited over 25 years for this son. As an old man, you finally had a son. Your wife had a miraculous son. I want you to give that right back to me. It says that Abraham goes up on this hill. He goes up to a hill to go and give the sacrifice to his, to his, uh, uh, to his God. And that as he's about to kill Isaac as a sacrifice to God in obedience. I know that Abraham, all the way to the moment that he raised his hand, he knew that God would still provide, but even if he didn't, he was still going to be obedient to him because God has been good to him. And so he's about to sacrifice the son. God stops him, and he says, you have been obedient to me. I already provide for you a sacrifice. There to the side is this little ram, this little goat there. They end up giving that sacrifice to God in honor, and, and, and Abraham Abraham says right there, he says, this is Jehovah Jireh. He is my provider. He will provide for my sacrifice. And he's done all this. It was not only a promise to Abraham there. It was a provider to all. It was a promise to all of Israel for all the future uh, uh, descendants that he will have, that he will provide a sacrifice. We know that that sacrifice is not just a goat, but that sacrifice would later be Jesus Christ. That not only was born there in Israel, but is sacrificed on that same hill. That same hill later on is called Mount Calvary. That on that same hill, Jesus is crucified on the cross in the same Jerusalem, in the same place as Melchizedek where he reigned. I mean, I'm telling you, it's just awesome the way it's all connected. But all of this was so that you would understand that Jesus isn't just a human priest and that Jesus wasn't just a representative of God here on earth, but that Jesus, it goes all the way back to say that Jesus was also, is also the King of kings, the Lord of lords because of his, his, his royal blood, but that he's also a priest. Never had we seen that only all the way back to Melchizedek, a king and a priest. And here is Jesus being king and priest. And as the king... He is able to authorize things. He has authority to say, I am going to die and I'm not going to die. And when he finally said, I will die because I love them, he died. He says that is finished. He dies in that place. At that moment, he goes, spiritually speaking, he goes into the temple. And, in, and, and as the high priest, he goes and gives a sacrifice for all of humanity. Not just for the Israelites and for that year as the tradition was. He gave himself, not just a goat, because a goat could only uh, die for, for, or, or be a sacrifice for one year. But Jesus, the Son of God, pure, holy, an actual human, he goes and he dies on the cross as the sacrifice, not only for that year, and not only for the past sins of Israel, but for all future sinners, so that it says in the book of Hebrews, no more sacrifice are needed. That today, in 2022, we don't have to shed any blood, that we don't have to pay Him anything, that we don't have to do anything to prove ourselves. All we have to say is, my God, you did it for me 2,000 years ago. I received the sacrifice and I am saved. Hallelujah. I am saved because of your blood. You did it for me. And the high priest, who is a representative and is able to enter into the, the holy place, and again, he had no sin, he was able to enter into the holy place. He didn't need bells, he didn't need a rope around his waist because he was sinless. He enters into the holy of holies, he sheds his own blood, and then after God the Father receives the blessing, receives the sacrifice, he turns around, he rips the veil open, and he says, all of you, enter with me freely into the temple, into the the Holy of Holies into the presence of God. And so all of this is, goes all the way back to because he has the authority to do so. Let me read 1 Peter chapter 2 to you. 1 Peter chapter 2 says, As you come to him, the living stone, that he is this stone that is alive, that is immovable, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to God, to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices accepted to God through Jesus Christ. You are also being built up to be part of this lineage now. You have been called, you have been chosen, and I'm talking to every single one of us. 
you in, in a certain way, in a different way, but you have been chosen and called to become a holy priesthood so that we could sa offer sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What kind of sacrifices? Animals still? Blood still? No. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion. Think of it, Zion, think of Jerusalem. A chosen and precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in Him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. He's simply using this, this uh, uh, symbolism of a, of a stone to, to, to speak of this is what we're founded on. When you build a house, when you build a building, you first have to build the corners, the cornerstone. A lot of buildings actually will, will recognize this is the, the cornerstone of this building. And when you begin with that corner, then it's like the foundation of the rest of the building. Then you keep going and you keep adding on to that. So that's what he's saying. To our faith, to what we believe in, He is the beginning of it all. He's the one that was able to establish all this. Why? Because He's the King and He's the High Priest. And so He becomes the cornerstone in which we, we uh, uh, base everything, the rest of what we're doing on Him. And so He's, in other words, just simple, He's saying follow His example. Verse, ver, uh, in verse 8, And a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. How many people you know that as soon as they meet Jesus, they got to make a decision. Do they live according to Him and what He expects of us so that we can finally live life and be free from our sin? Or do we go, just keep going our, our own selfish ways? And to a lot of people, after meeting Jesus, they still choose their selfish ways. Oh, but they stumble. Oh, but it's tough. After you meet Jesus, sinning, you could still sin, but it sure is annoying. It sure is like uh, that conviction is always there. You know you're doing wrong. You're still doing it, and you don't even enjoy it. You might try to cover it up for a night, but in the morning, oh, there, you're not just hung over. The Holy Spirit is there. He's still speaking to you, bringing conviction over your life. You're stumbling. You're falling. And so they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But here we go. Verse 9. Can we read it together? Just read it together with me. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Once, verse 10, once you were not a people, you were just sinners, you were enemies, you were not even, you were not His people. But now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Oh, hallelujah. That you were sinners, you were dying in your, in your ways, in your evil. And that, remember last week, because of the Spirit, we are now born. We have a new life. We are born again, not by flesh, not like a, two humans have a child. But we are by the Spirit of God. We have a new life. And so now we live not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And that's why. This is why. Now, let me give you your, your, your three points. Number one, the King calls us to become. The King calls us to do a few things. Three things today. Calls us to become royal priests. He calls you and me to become a royal priest. That in the same way that we take on the example of Jesus, Jesus is a royal priest. He says that you are now a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Church, you were not saved. He didn't simply die on the cross so that you don't feel bad anymore because of you stole something once, because you committed adultery once, because you... Uh, uh, you, you lied and you're a gossiper or because you got high on something and you shoot it up something. Not just because of your past sins. It's not, that, it's not that simple. It's not beautiful, yes, but he doesn't end there. He says, you are now forgiven of your sin. I receive your, 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 uh, uh, your asking of, of forgiveness, your repentance. You repented of your sin. I forgive you, period. It's done. You are clean. You are washed. Get up, though. Get up from your sin. You are now pure. You are now holy. And you have now the authority that I have as king. You are my son. You are my daughter. Now that authority of a royal king that Melchizedek had, that David had, that, that Jesus has, all of that is on you now. 
You are a high priest. You are not only a king so that you could walk around, like I said last week, and, and, and think that you're cute and just say, I'm God's favorite. I'm just a, I'm a queen. I'm a king. And, and, and everybody else bowed down to me because I'm God's favorite and I'm his daughter and I'm a princess. No. You are also a royal priest and a priestesses. Don't think that it's just, oh, it's just for men. No, that now there is no man or woman. There is no Jew, Jew or Gentile. All of us together. God sees every one of his sons and daughters. And he sees us and he says, you are royalty. You have authority. You pick up your head and stop living as a shameful beggar. You have, you have complete access to the Son of God and to Jesus and to the Father and to the Holy Spirit. You have complete access to the presence of God. But... You are also a representative, not only for yourself, but to your own family, and to your neighborhood, and to your job, and to everyone.